afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the meeting of the Merrill Common Authority Elders and Security Committee. Um, if we can start with the first item, which is to nominate a chair for the forthcoming year. Have we had any nominations? Chair, I'll move Councillor Ross from Sheffield. So we second that. Thank you. In that case, welcome, Councillor Ross. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, um, and get on uh, with the items on the agenda. Um, welcome and apologies. We've received apologies from Councillor Clark, uh, and we have. No, it's the other Councillor Clark. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, Councillor Maggie Clark from from Rotherham. Okay. Thank you, and those are the only apologies we received. But actually, it's the first meeting for um, some members. So if I quickly go around the table, starting with myself, I'm Councillor Colin Ross, and a member from Sheffield. Hi, I'm Steve Davenport. I'm the MCA Monitoring Officer and Chief Legal Officer. Hi, Councillor Jeff Ennis, representing Barnsley. Councillor Brian Lodge from Sheffield. Councillor Jane Kidd from Doncaster. Uh, Councillor John Clark from uh, the Barnes of Council. Hi, I'm Ellen Hinsley uh, for taking the minutes. Hello, Chair. Uh, Tim Taylor, Director of Public Transport Operations, here to uh, just present as an officer today. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jordan from Sheffield. Hello, Councillor Diane Hurst from Sheffield. Uh, Ruth Adams, the MCA's uh, Deputy Chief Executive. Thank you. Um, next item is urgent items and announcements. Uh, we have no urgent items, but I've got an announcement to make that one of the major items or the major item on the agenda today was mayoral scrutiny of the new mayor of south yorkshire mayor oliver coppard unfortunately at the very last minute uh, mayor coppard has been called to an urgent meeting about the future of sheffield doncaster airport and so we'll not be able to attend the meeting this afternoon however We'll still, when we come to that item on the agenda, be able to table some questions and hopefully officers will be able to answer those um, questions in, in his absence. Okay, um, item four on the agenda is items to be considered in the absence of press and public. There are none. Uh, declarations of interest by any members. Uh, do any members have any declarations of interest to make by items on the agenda today? There are none. Questions from the members of the public? I believe we don't have any tabled at the moment. So there's no, no questions from the public. Minutes of the previous meeting. Um, sorry, can I just, just go back a, a moment? Uh, uh, just uh, I've got a, um, a message here that the um, Christine Marriott circulated a Centre for Governance and Scrutiny report called Considerations for Improving Citizen Participation in the Scrutiny of Combined Authorities of England. Um, that was circulated to us a few days ago and it was about getting you know, more involvement of the, of the public. Do any members of the committee have any comments to make about that paper. I think we'd all wish to see members coming along um, to this meeting, either remotely or, or in person, uh, to ask questions, if that can be facilitated. 
Okay. Um, minutes of the previous meeting, which was on the 23rd of March, uh, 2020, which I was attending remotely because of COVID at, at the time. Um, can I take them these as an accurate record? Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Um, next item is uh, matters arising and the action log. Is there anything um, that's left over from there? One item in the action log was writing a thank you letter to Dan Jarvis for his service during his tenure as mayor, which has been done. So that has been discharged from the action log. Are there any other items that people want to raise from the action log? Which is pages 13 onward on your agenda. Okay, thank you. Just to update members on the Brownfield Housing Fund, uh, the decision was reached that we will go out. I pressed the button, but it's broken my button, so I have to press the other side. Sorry about that. Um, that the Brownfield Housing Fund a decision has been made by the MCA that to ensure that we maximise the opportunity for that, we're going to put an open call out to look for some additional new schemes to make sure that that delivers. So that decision was made by the Merrill Combined Authority and will be um, enacted over the next coming weeks. As you, as you can see, the next item was the evaluation of concessionary bus fares and uh, Tim Taylor did circulate some information to us. And I think that's the only items on the action log. Okay, going back to the agenda, we're now up to review of the latest forward plan of key decisions. The reason why this is on the agenda is that uh, we put this on a couple of years ago so that members have a, um, in front of them various things that are going on in the different committees of the um, Merrill Combined Authority so it makes it easier to pick up any issues that they feel that they'd want to bring to this committee for, for scrutiny. With that in mind, has anybody got any questions or issues arising from the... Um, Review a forward plan of decision. Uh, sorry, the the um, forward plan of key key decisions to be made. Yeah. Councillor Alton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I realise that although it's on the forward plan, the twenty fifth of July has already happened. But I I would like to ask about the um, transforming cities fund T six. I'm putting page eighteen. Transforming cities fund T six southwest bus corridors. Um, in Sheffield. I, the reason I want to ask about this is um, I raised this at Strategy and Resources in Sheffield when the uh, capital approval there went through, um, asking for some sort of assurance to be given to the businesses on those roads who have petitioned against, not against the scheme in general, which I think we all support, but specifically all day bus lanes being included in that. And the reason I was told I couldn't put an amendment to that capital approval was that this might put the funding that you know put the funding from from the mayor's point of view in jeopardy, and that it would have to go, go back to the mayor's office and the mayor you know if we put we shouldn't be putting conditions on it at that point. I think was basically the point that was made to me. Um, Councillor Lodge will remember. Um, so my question is, you know, can we give some assurance to those businesses that the proposals won't include twelve-hour bus lanes? And um, you know, is the mayor's office uh, supportive of giving that assurance, or is it a is there a blockage to doing that? Who can pick this up? Um, Ruth? I, can, I, can, I can start. Let's get the right side. So the, um, the approval was given for, was for development costs to develop the scheme. Normally at a, a strategic business case, we do ask the scheme promoter to make us aware of any, we publish um, the business case, to make aware of any concerns or com complaints or concerns or engagement that they've done, particularly on transport schemes. So we can have a look in, in, in light of um, Councillor Otten's suggestion that there's quite a lot of potential opposition to this, we can make sure that we, we look at that and see how the scheme promoter factors that into the next stage of the development. 
because uh, we've only seen the strategic business case, this is to unlock the development funding to start the next phase bit. So we will be, be mindful of um, what that looks like. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I, like I said, I don't, you know, I think everybody supports the scheme as a whole and nobody wants to delay it or anything like that. But um, I am conscious that we had representations made to, to Council Sheffield some months ago now, the businesses that were very concerned that their lives would be affected by that one element that was to be consulted on. I appreciate that it will be consulted on, but um, I think I think the sooner we can get that assurance, if it indeed is if it's coming at all, then the sooner we get it, the better. So I, I, I thank you for that. So. Okay, well, thank you for that. But just to underline what Councillor Orton said, that it, there's many positive aspects of the scheme which are fully supported. It's just one element of it which is contentious. And Chair, sorry, just briefly, it, it, uh, can I suggest if, um, as part of the minutes, we record when we we're expecting FBC approval for that as well? That would help give a, an indication of time scale. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pitt. I realise it's the decision that's actually been taken. I've just but the approval for commissioning priorities of skills boot camps. Can we just have some more information on what a skills boot camp is and what the commissioning priorities actually are? Yes. I think I can um, just update a little bit that that was a key decision that wasn't taken forward. Skills boot camps were uh, an initiative uh, that the government put out that areas could bid for money to do some rapid work if they felt they, they needed it. Uh, we didn't have a, a sort of bidding partner come forward to sort of say so. I think it was put on the forward plan as a holder, but the board didn't consider it because we, in the end, didn't submit a bid to government for it. But but I certainly can uh, get something uh, more thorough about what, what the government criteria was for skills boot camps. Okay, thank you. I think that's close that item. Right, we now come to item eight on the agenda which is mayoral <coughs> scrutiny which is where we've got a bit of a problem as we haven't got a mayor to scrutinize at this moment but uh, we'll do our best um have um, members got questions they uh, would have put to the mayor and really are, are relatively urgent and we can see if officers can can pick those those up yes thank you uh, it's just about uh, in the Mr. Coppard's manifesto, he was on about levelling up equalities of health from north to south, and I think it set a target of 100 days uh, by appointing somebody to that task. I just wonder if somebody's been appointed and what's the latest position. I know it's a difficult situation because it's been ongoing for quite a number of years, but I just wonder what the latest thing is with it. If I start on the appointment bit and then if if I might bring Felix in to just say a little bit more about the health uh, priority uh, for the region in a little bit more detail. So, yes, the mayor, one of the mayor's um, priorities in the manifesto is the disparities in health that um, uh, occur across the region, and that uh, he always uses an example that someone in Sheffield at one end of Ecclesall Road can have a totally different life expectancy from the other end, and and how this plays into agendas like active travel, access to health, the sort of uh, how the economy and the environment affect people's life expectancy. Is in some advanced discussions with someone who can sort of lead. Uh, the development of an action plan that's not quite finalized in terms of all the appointment but but the the mayor is going to be putting out a statement at 100 days about where things are up to so we're expecting that in the next few weeks to be finalized and hopefully then we'll have some more clarity on on an officer uh, who will be in the the sort of immediate term taking forward some actions on on that agenda so for the appointment um, but but perhaps uh, Felix has uh, done some policy work on uh, some of the issues about health disparities and uh, and the work we're doing and could perhaps say a little bit more about some of what the data and what the challenges are for, for the person when appointed in, in pulling that together. Felix, if you'd like to contribute. Thank you. Happily. Um, hello. We have done a fair bit of work on this uh, even before the mayor took office and this will only ramp up as you know um, 
the challenges we've got in terms of health outcomes in South Yorkshire and a lot of the north of England is a huge drag not only on people's lives and livelihoods but on our economy, which is where as a combined authority we've our remit to grow the economy. Um, this is a particular issue for us. I think there's evidence to say that in about <coughs> a third of our productivity is determined by health outcomes. So if you don't work that through in terms of uh, uh, the challenges that we've got, in, 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 then this, this is a, a huge issue for us. South Yorkshire carries a level of economic inactivity which is way above um, the national average. And if you take out retired people and students, the biggest contributor to that is health related. Um, so again, you can see the impact that could have if we could make an impact here and the difference that could make in terms of the labor market and people then having access to uh, employment and the changes that brings to their, their lives. The way we're looking at this is we're working in partnership with a lot of uh, our anchor institutions. So the Integrated Care Board and now the ICP, the partnership that has been put together, the NHS, the local authorities, and a lot of the third sector partners. We launched some research work which Ruth talked about. And that has given us a good sense of the assets that we've got, the health and well-being assets that we've got in South Yorkshire. And a handle on some of the numbers, like you know, one in every eight pounds generated in South Yorkshire is from the sector. For example, almost 90,000 people employed in the sector. But also a good sense of the number of businesses here and the opportunities in the sector. So we are looking at this in the round. There is a contribution of the sector to our economy. There is the health outcomes of people, and if we could make a difference there, how that would change their lives. There is the impact, particularly with uh, uh, the cost of living crisis that we are having, the health-related challenges there. <coughs> and in talking to Oliver, and we just this morning having a conversation about potentially having a much bigger workshop with all these partners to work through some of this. The research we are happy to send through to you for you to look at at your leisure. We're just finalizing that. But we're now thinking through once this new person that we just talked about takes post. There's somebody in my team already who's working on this, coming together with all the key partners to then identify the key actions that the MCA can take in this space, not, you know, uh, uh, not noting that our impact is potentially limited to where we have a particular investments that we're making or the leadership that the mayor can take in convening partners to be able to take action. But whatever it is, um, being able to exploit that fully uh, uh, and, and to make a difference. This is a huge part of um, our agenda because if we are going to grow the economy, we do have to make some inroads when it comes to health inequalities. So I'm sure you'll hear a lot more from us as we develop, as we develop it. Yes, come, yeah, come one back. of the main issues that concern me is mental health issues. There seem to be more and more people with mental health issues and also dementia seem to be spreading rapidly. We've even got young people now. I think I read an article where somebody at 41 had got a start of dementia. So they are two really big problems that, that we've got, mental health, which is enormous, and the onset of dementia. Thank you. We already have a program running called Working Win, which supports people with mental health uh, into work, if that is appropriate. And I think colleagues are already working on an extension to that to go even beyond mental health if, if, if it's needed, but definitely continue to focus on, on mental health and supporting people into work where that is suitable, appropriate for them. So the MCA is doing something here, and we've, we've been doing it for a while, working with central government. But I agree with you um, that that is a particular challenge, and it's one that <coughs> we, we, need to, we need to continue to work with all our partners to see you know, how we could make a difference. We do believe that 
the key determinants of health cut across most of the things that we work on on a day to day. So it's no uh, uh, coincidence that people with multiple health challenges more likely, more often than not, also have some other challenges, you know, socioeconomic challenges related. And if there are ways in which the interventions that we design, design with partners and invest in can help prevent some of these, improve the quality of life of people, which then moves them out of the risk group that makes um, some of these health challenges a reality further down the line. If we could do that, that is exactly where we want to be. So I agree with you, we accept uh, uh, the point. It's a huge challenge nationally, um, but we work in, we, we work in as hard as we can. Okay, Councillor Carr. Yeah, can, I, can I just add to that? Interesting part of your answer there was talking about working with partners and widening it, not just to frontline medical services, but you know, medical research from the, the incubator hubs that we, we've got, got in the region. Um, I think members of the public are, um, I accept that, and that's a good way forward. And obviously the clinical commission group in teaching hospitals got a part to play in working partnership with them. One of the disparities is in provision of GP practices. Has the combined authority got any influence or help it can give in establishing you know, GP practices um, throughout the area? Because we see you know, um, practices closing, practices combining, and people having to travel distances. Is there any help or encouragement we can give in that direction? It's very, it's very limited. We don't have in our devolution deal uh, a health deal that gives us powers over um, primary uh, and uh, secondary care services. The mayor wants to work very, very closely with the integrated care partnership and the and the providers of health, probably more closely than uh, uh, previous uh, mayorality did, um, uh, and so he's he's focused on trying to. Uh, influence, I suppose, as much as possible, but, but the, the devolution deal we have is very different to the Manchester deal, which had quite a lot of um, NHS um, powers that were devolved to a health partnership. We, we've not got those same powers. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I have one that's been brought up to me and um, last, last week, and it may have been overtaken by events. Um, it's about the buses and school transport in particular. Um, this, this occurs across, across the region, cuts the bus services. In particular, local comprehensive serves not just the S17 outskirts, but um, also in a city segment. And it needs three buses to get the children from the Lowfield area out to King Egbert's school. It's been cut to two. Um, not all the children will fit on two buses that come from, from that area and certainly going home. Now, I've read in the press about a five million pound package to address this problem. So the specific question is, um, will it be, enable all the school bus services to be saved? and? I've got a particular question, obviously, about my, my own local comprehensive. Uh, thank you, Chair. If I, if I start just off by giving some general numbers around the bus service division, you're absolutely right. So the Command Authority at the start of this week approved the use of £5.1 million of reserves for um, protecting non-statutory school services. So these are school buses that are currently run commercially um, by bus operators for which the combined authority and local authorities have no statutory requirement to provide home school transport for children. That, that's a requirement only where children live more than three miles uh, by the nearest walking distance from their nearest school. So that's, that's just a requirement uh, to, to set out clearly what, that, what the statutory obligations are. Having said that, there are um, currently 136 school buses, full services running across South Yorkshire. Um, which are a mixture of existing commercial tenured services, so the, the statutory six that we already make provision for, 
and the commercial services that commercial operators largely first are, are hoping to have, um, have in place. Because of um, the uh, reduction in patronage and the change in their commercial position, first have taken the decision to cancel um, 71 of the 76 services uh, across the Sussex region uh, with effect from the end of this academic year. So the 5.1 million is to cover the cost of those cancelled services. Um, we've, we've done a detailed analysis of every school that's affected by this process um, and looked where possible, and this will, I'll come on to your specific example in a moment, but looked where possible to either replace that on a direct like flight basis or make use of the existing commercial bus network or the planned existing commercial bus network that will be in place from September. Um, in respect of uh, King Edbert's, um, our view was that there are, um, with the two buses provided, so the Staffordshire and non-Staffordshire school children, um, on top of that, there are existing commercial services, so namely the 98, um, but also there's a 97 and 218, which is a, a short walk from the school, um, which give um, a combined um, fif minimum 15 minute frequency to the school. And the 98 departs 10 minutes after the second school bus as per the current timetable and is at the start of service. So there will be more than adequate space on that vehicle for pupils at the end of day. Um, Can I just come back on that? Because the terminus is actually at the school. Yeah. So that commercial service will fill up and sterilise that bus during the whole of its journey. So the public won't have access to the 98, you know, all the way into on, into town on a single trip chair but again as i say there are other services on that corridor and it's at a point of low demand uh, I, um, I, I was about to say we're happy to review any of these points in particular in, in work with councillors and with the local authority but on on that looking at the boarding numbers and the data that we have you know our view was that, that um, three buses were not required at this point because we have to make that budget go as far as we possibly can for the whole of south yorkshire Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, Carry no, on. But, um, um, uh, that, that was uh, my summary in terms of where we're at on the school. So we are, um, just very briefly, we, we're in the process of tendering those services now. Operators have to return their tender bids or tender returns to us um, or close of play Monday, so the 5th of August. Uh, sorry, close of play mon uh, Friday, 5th of August. Uh, we'll be awarding week commencing the 8th of August. So we'll know the details of which schools we want to, uh, or which services we want to provide in the next couple of weeks, and um, we'll be starting to publish that information on the Travel South Yorkshire website from uh, um, mid August at the very latest. You you mentioned the figure seventy one out of seventy six. Do you mean that there's only five buses then that of the of the existing network that aren't going to be covered? Uh, no, sorry, Chad. Um, uh, what I meant by that that there are currently 76 commercial bus school buses in operation on the network of those 76 71 are provided by first south yorkshire and, so, and they're cancelling 71 into 76 the other five are just two operators so the overwhelming loss of the school bus network that we are seeing is as a consequence of the commercial cuts so this 5.1 million package how many of the 71 will it cover so our, our estimates on the work we've done thus far is, um, and again, it's entirely dependent on the cost that operators come back to us with, but we estimate uh, approximately £2.2 .2 million pounds per full academic year to cover the services being tendered. So that will last for uh, the two academic years in question. So uh, that'll be September 23 through to July 2024. No, I'm sorry, I probably didn't phrase my question correctly. If we're losing 71 services... 76 services. Sorry. 70 the 76 services, how many of those 76 have we tendered for? All of them, yeah. But you just said in the previous question that the three uh, three buses that were going to King Egbert's are now only going to be two. Oh, no, we, we're tendering for each individual service, but not the number of buses necessarily to replace those services, yeah. Right, okay. There's a difference between services and buses per service. And so the tender, there'll be a number of buses lost, as in other examples as well, throughout 
stop indeed, you. Yeah, no, indeed, this isn't a problem unique to Premier Bridge. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is, yeah, we've had to take that difficult, uh, you yeah. know, that difficult decision on a number of other locations in terms of um, reduced provision where there is a uh, what we deem to be an adequate commercial alternative. Are they, while we're on buses, any other specific question about buses, Councillor Olsen? Um, thank, thank you, Chair. Apologies if this is old hat for this this board, which I, I, I am new to. But um, my question would be on the regarding the information displayed on bus stops and in the apps and the, the website and so on. Um, a large part of the feedback I get on the network is how inaccurate it is, and I don't. And the question is, you know, I I, I guess we don't have complete control over that. The the the, the that is reliance on information coming from the operators, but at what point do we say? Do we do we do? Uh, firstly, do we know how ina exactly how inaccurate it is? And secondly, at what point do we say you're not giving us accurate information? We're not going to publish it on our bus stops because we don't trust it, and it's causing more grief for passengers than it would be if we said we just don't know when the next bus is going to be. Um, so the timetable information provided at stops is accurate as per the information that each operator is legally obliged to register with the traffic commissioner. So they have to register a specific timetable at uh, intervals and at points of time that you know it is to a statutory duty for them to do that. We generate the timetables on the basis of that information that they provide to us in advance of the service change and they have a minimum amount of time in which they have to provide that in advance. Um, for the October changes, which I'm sure all members are fairly aware of that are coming uh, later this year, we'll effectively be replacing every stop with a new timetable mm. because almost every service is likely to be affected so that's the proposal that we're working on at the moment and we clearly it'll take a number of weeks for us to distribute timetables to each of the carousels and stops and including interchanges as well in terms of online information um, we use a combination of either the timetable which i said is a, a, a statutory requirement or what's known as real-time data mm. so a number of the buses in south yorkshire particularly first and stagecoach but not uniquely contain um, effectively a mobile phone card against which we can track their location and time um, but it is entirely reliant on a that working and the relay between us and that information source being accurate by the operators so we're reliant on the commercial operators providing us that data in a timely and accurate information in a timely manner um, quite often people will misinterpret the difference between when a bus is due and it's being tracked in real time and a prediction on the basis of just a timetable only and at the moment it's quite difficult for people to dis interpret or differentiate between those two mm -hmm. data sources. Having said that, I think it is still, um, you know, it is still as useful as it can be for operator, uh, for, for passengers. You'll see at some stops we have the, the digital displays, which again will give them a time as well on the basis of the location, the services which we know of that serve that stop. Um, but I'm entirely aware that, you know, it is also still difficult and not accurate in every instance. So, you know, there is further work for the MCA to do in that area and increase the provision of those digital displays and stops for people. Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure that I'm interpreting it correctly because, um, you know, I mean, I, I used to understand that if it was a, if it was a number, it was like half past four, that that was a timetable, and if it was three minutes, with a little radio symbol next to it, that was a, a piece of live data. But I've seen so many, and, and so many people I've spoken to have seen the same, so many buses purportedly thought they understood to be a live time, three minutes, two minutes, one minute due, doesn't arrive. And then it starts showing what time the, the, the following bus is, is, is meant to arrive. So, um, you know, unless unless the unless the bus operator has put their SIM card in a car and is driving around the city, I don't see how um, it's possible to generate a live time for a bus that doesn't exist in that way. Your understanding is correct, but it also relies on operators to tell us that the, their services are also on time and cancelled as well. And certainly with FIRST at the moment, so if I just give you a bit of brief background to where FIRST commercial position is, they're still somewhere in the region of 70 drivers short for Sheffield for, in terms of their location. So what we're seeing at the moment is services which should be cancelled in that real-time system, which are not being cancelled, mm -hmm. and therefore we are only, again, we are wholly reliant on operators providing us with accurate and timely data. Without that, we can only put on the information that we're aware of. So, um, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not purporting it to be a perfect position that we find ourselves in, but, you know, we are only, con we are only in control of one very small part of that process. I mean, okay. I, mean, I appreciate. I appreciate that you know it is not something we're in control of, and you know, I'm, I'm just saying my personal attempts to use the bus to get into town instead of driving, and most of them have failed, um, and I've had to I've had to resort to other means um, in recent in recent weeks. So, 
Um, and, and, and it's been due to inaccurate information on the bus stop and buses promised not arriving and um, you know, running, running out of time to, to, to go by bus. And other people I've speak to have said the same. So um, I, th it goes back to the question of uh, at what point do we say this information, do we know actually how accurate it is? At what point do we say this is not so inaccurate? And if, if you know, if the, if the bus companies are out of drivers and they're cancelling lots of services, it's going to be far less accurate than usual. At what point do we say this is so bad, this information that we're giving people false promises and they're just not going to rely, rely on the information on the bus stop? And at what point do we, do we change our priority in terms of inve investment in the network to say digital designs on bus stops would be great to have if they could be accurate, but at the moment they're so inaccurate, let's focus our investment on something else. And, and so, so just to, you know, just as very specific on that, the displays themselves are accurate on the basis of the information we provide. And I keep repeating this point, but we are reliant on the operators to provide us with accurate data. We do not have control over that data because we have no control over those commercial operators. So, actually, you know, were the MTA to make a decision on franchising and, to, and the MTA to, you know, have greater control over the provision and arrangement of those services? You know, inevitably that will give us a greater degree of control over the provision of that information. But uh, as you say, um, this is born very much from the position we find ourselves with the devolved network and with operators having challenges, particularly around resource and provision of services on the basis of that resource at this moment in time. Um, uh, on balance, I would suggest switching it off or not providing it would be more detrimental than, than providing it, accepting that there are errors in the data at this moment in time. Um, I'm happy to provide some information to, um, to the committee on um, indicative levels of inaccuracy, if that would be helpful. Um, I'll think that through either a future meeting or put it in the minutes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you. Um, you you've, just, you've, just, you've just suggested another reason why franchising would be a, a good idea. Uh, Councillor Hurst. Thank you, Chair. Um, we know that the mayor and, and officers are working extremely hard on buses and bus services and franchising in the airport, but I want to move the conversation on perhaps and, and, and talk about um, other concerns that are, are exercising you at the moment. Given the need to emergency and the climate crisis and the cost of living crisis, I was interested to read about the um, the retrofit task force to start to work towards technological joined up solutions across the across South Yorkshire. And I wondered where if there's any information around about where that fits into the work programme and when that may be um, starting work and when we may be in a position to be able to receive a, a report about um, progress and advances that have are being made. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ruth, are I, you? I can have a start. I'm, I'm looking at Felix again, whether Felix might need to, to come and uh, uh, join us again. So, um, yes, yeah, the, the Mayor had a, a large priority in the uh, manifesto about retrofit and about nature and, and nature partnerships and certainly the environment, net zero and climate change. There's a few things happening, and Felix team the, uh, at the minute, Felix and John, who do the data, are working through all the things that we've got, got in place. And uh, the mayor started to meet with our Net Zero program director to look at the partnership we put together. And again, uh, as with the, the health issue, we're working with some uh, academics again about what what steps we can take quite quickly and what really need uh, national, international action that are way out of the, the scope of the region. One of the things that has happened recently is that um, DEFRA have asked mayoral combined authorities to um, take a additional statutory responsibility for developing, uh, I'm gonna get the words right here because I get the wording of the manifesto and the wording of the DEFRA thing a nature recovery strategy, so uh, uh, responsibility. And we're just waiting for the legal agreements, the mayoral combined authority as uh, a signal that they're willing to accept this additional uh, responsibility. And so we're working through the detail of what that will mean for DEFRA uh, in terms of local responsibility for a local nature recovery strategy. So it's very early stage pulling these threads together. So. Um, 
we, we and I think, as I say, I will pass over to Felix because I think he's meeting the mayor on this or has met the mayor on this recently, uh, to look at all, again, the, the, the different um, aspects of the agenda, uh, but, but certainly retrofit and uh, what might need to happen on retrofit uh, of housing is uh, one of the big priorities. Felix? Um, thank you. Uh, I came just in case you have any further questions, that's all. But maybe just to add to what Ruth just said, th this is a huge agenda. Um, and retrofit is only one subset of the wider sustainability and environmental um, agenda and the net, the net zero the climate emergency that the combined authority declared a couple of years ago. On retrofit in particular, we've got a colleague who's working on this and very soon you know, there'll be a lot more coming out that we can share. The biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges, has to do with funding. The MCA cannot um, meet this target by itself when it comes to retrofitting the homes that need to be retrofitted in South Yorkshire. Um, I think we've got one of the highest, I don't remember the exact number, but one of the highest in terms of share of the housing stock. Our, our area has one of the highest shares of areas of houses rated D or worse when it comes to um, environment, you know, the, the emissions and, and how eco-friendly our homes are in South Yorkshire. But most, about 70, 80% of our homes, maybe more, are in private ownership. So finding a funding model that enables all the partners to be able to sit comfortably around the table and share the cost to meet the objective of, re of retrofitting all these homes, the majority of which are privately owned. Um, it's not a conundrum that anybody has cracked yet. Oh, and, but we know, and we're working with our other local uh, combined authority partners to find a way of doing this. So colleagues in Liverpool city region, um, for example, are a bit ahead of us, but we are working with them on it, on the funding issue. But there are many other angles to this. And um, in due course, when we've done a bit more work, if you want us to come and talk through that, we'll very happily do that. <coughs> Just got the data. So approximately 620,000 homes in South Yorkshire, 62% of those are D or below rated. The English average is 58. At an estimate of 15,000 per home, the cost of upgrade would be circa 6 billion and government have made, which it says 10 million central government funding. So uh, that's the sort of, uh, just to give an indication of the sort of scale of the, the investment uh, required. Diane, that's it. That, thank you, so that was, that was extremely, um, I was surprised that with everything else that was going on that so much progress had been made, but I would welcome a, a Item on the agenda if that's possible. Okay, um, prompting when we come to sort of the forward plan. Just on that, sort of slightly different, um, as well as insulation and things, about solar panel fitting. I mean, there are two models for solar panels. You, you can either buy them yourselves and you get the feed in tariff, or companies will fit them free of charge and they'll get the feed in tariff, but the homeowner will get the benefit of the electricity during the day. Have we entered any discussions with any of the solar panel companies about this second model as a way of doing it? The MCA hasn't at this point. We have looked at it. Um, again, it's, it comes back to some of what we were talking about earlier on. We've explored it. There are some inherent challenges in this space. So, for example, the market is now growing, but it's way behind where it needs to be. There aren't enough qualified technicians in this space to do it to meet the potential demand. The costs at this point are deemed too high for the majority of house home homeowners. Um, and how the MCA 
corporate partners could actually enter into this space and provide the necessary funding or other support needed to make this palatable um, for, for homeowners. We've not been able to crack yet, but we're looking at it. A few things have changed recently. The fuel in tariffs have changed significantly. Um, government has changed the numbers and it's not as profitable as it was. There is a huge debate going on now. Many people lobbying governments to remove that completely because that goes on our, those of us who don't have that, that goes on our bills anyway. Um, and given where home energy bills are going, there's a huge debate for government to remove that from our bills. If that happens, it becomes less attractive. However, on the other side, the economics tells us that if demand for this goes up, supply, if we do our homework right, will meet it and price will fall. That hasn't happened yet, so financially it's difficult. But the MCA is exploring this um, with, with our other local authority partners and combined authority partners and the central government, but that we don't have a solution yet. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tom. It's just to follow up on that, really, we're on about solar panels and things like that. But in our area, we've got some ambitions for ground source heating and air source heating. Is it the same reason for funding because of funding, you know, uh, obstructions that that's not gaining momentum? Thank you. It, it is. Um, if you put in, and I'm no expert here, but if I remember correctly, when those who know were telling me, you put in a ground source heat pump, it takes at least 10 years for it to pay back. Um, the average tenancy for a private uh, rented property is much less than that. Who carries that cost? Landlords being prepared to pick that up. We've just not been able to crack that yet. However, um, the MCA has a housing fund, a brownfield housing fund. We're going to be putting out a call in the next few weeks for, for uh, uh, developers to come forward. And one of the key things in there, the criteria that we are setting out, is the energy rating of homes and seeking modern methods of construction and uh, uh, innovative heating solutions. So where it's within our control, we are looking at it, but obviously we know that it's a small part of the market and there's a lot more work that needs to go. Okay, thank you. Any other points? I've got two. Um, one, I think it's a very quick one. Just again, it's from um, about buses and bus pass eligibility. It was about a student, mature student, uh, studying at Northern College, over 21, and a number of them clearly not eligible for student passes. Are there any other concession repairs that they may be eligible for, or has any thought been given to mature students being um, added to the eligibility criteria? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, if they are aged 21, they're still eligible for the Zoom Beyond product, so that covers people up to the day before their 22nd birthday. So, um, older than that, there is a 18 to 22 discount card that Travel Master, who are the regional multi multi operator ticketing company, um, they have, which gives a 15% discount on all of their product ranges. Um, so that's up to the day before their 23rd birthday, in essence. But over that age, no, it's um, full adult fare schemes only at, at this moment in time. Having said that, we've had discussions already with the mayor about what options we'd like to look at in consideration of uh, new concessions or travel concessions, and you know, that's an ongoing live discussion at this moment in time. But we can certainly look at more targeted interventions if there is um, uh, uh, ambition and uh, desire to do so across the combined authority. I think that, that feeds into the whole debate about bus patronage and usage and encouraging bus patronage because obviously. Um, alternatives, you know, for, for using private transport or whatever. Okay, the other point I want to raise, and I'm not sure um, who can say much on this because it's ongoing, which is why the mayor isn't in here. Um, 
what's the state of play with the combined authority and interventions into um, Sheffield, Doncaster Sheffield Airport? Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, as members will know, Peel, the owners of DSA, announced the strategic review, I think it was on the 13th of July, um, citing that the operations are no longer commercially viable, but undertaking a, a review, which, which it's going to go into late August, early September, as we understand it. In terms of the MCA's response, obviously, along with other leaders, there was a joint statement put out. Um, but behind the scenes, officers are working between Docs Council and the MCA um, as an internal group and also working with Peel themselves to see what options Peel are really looking at and what options are available for us to examine. And, and as part of that, we're seeking information and data from Peel um, to ensure those options include air side operations. Um, so that work is ongoing. Peel obviously owns the site and um, it's a commercial operation. But the MCA are keen to, along with Docs Council, to explore all options and challenge Peel on their assumptions um, that have led to the strategic review. Um, so we're working with other partners in the region, obviously working in the business sector and lobbying government as well in terms of what can be achieved. Um, so you know, I can assure members of work, is, a lot of work is ongoing in the region um, on a number of levels with a number of stakeholders. Obviously, the airport is essential to um, the, the, the economy of the, the immediate area around the airport. There's a significant amount of development land linked to, intrinsically linked um, to airport operations and the number of businesses there, but also to the wider economy of South Yorkshire. So, as I say, a lot of work is ongoing. Um, and, you know, members, as I say, members can be assured, assured of that. Um, I don't know if anything else you want to ask about it. Um, the, the combined authority actually has put quite a bit of investment yeah. in the airport in terms of the link road and various yeah. things like that to make it viable. So I think I mean there's a history with Peel and Sheffield Airport in in the past as as well. Um, it's, uh, is there much we can do? I mean, uh, you, you're right. With, I think there's roughly, if I remember right, there's around 20 million funding put into the link road structure. Um, there are also separate loans from the MCA to Peel. It's about eight million pounds worth of loans have gone in so far. Um, so that's the level of investment. You know, um, and the, you know, there were, it's been public domain, there were ongoing discussions up to uh, early this year about further investment. Um, but you know, again, there will be lots of further work ongoing um, with, with Peel. So it's significant investment so far. Councillor Alton. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, if I could be a little bit blunter about this. I mean, there are regions that, that end up putting um, ongoing financial support into airports, um, perhaps not intentionally, uh, but they end up with, 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 with liabilities to keep their airports open. They end up putting large amounts of money in. I mean, and, and I, th I do think it's interesting that the, 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 there was a minister saying that this is an option, you can just nationalise the airport and take responsibility for it. Um, that a Conservative mayor somewhere else has done has, has done that and is is spending a lot of money on it, and um, we have a Labour mayor who said he's he's not sure nationalisation is the right thing to do. So I, I don't know what that means. That the politics is a little bit topsy turvy at the moment. But but I mean I suppose the question is um, if we were to end up in a position where we were sub, you know putting money into the airport on an ongoing basis, whether deliberately or because accidentally because we'd taken on some liabilities that. That we hope wouldn't crystallise. Um, a, would that be possible? And B, what would that, you know, where would that money come from? What would we we'd be losing in terms of our, our other spending if that's where we find ourselves? I think I think that's really part of the work that's ongoing. We're looking at options. Um, I, I don't know whether you know, sat here there moment where that funding would come from, what the level it would be, how it would be achieved. But at the moment, that you know, Peel are the owners and the operators. Uh, there, it's a commercial airport. Um, those decisions rest with them. Um, but we, we want to look at the options with them to secure 
the say, air side operations on that site as part of a wider regeneration there for that area. Any further questions on the airport? Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, it's obviously, you know, like you said, Peel own it. It's ultimately it's their decision. What sort of leverage do we have um, with them? I think there, there are a number of areas where pressure can be brought. When I say the business community. Um, the, you know, I'm sure the planning status of the whole site will need looking at as well. Um, you know, there's linkages around that site. Again, I don't know the detail at this moment. It, it, we're starting to do the work with Peel uh, and the Don offices from Doncaster to look at all options. I say, um, you know, there's nothing to be specific with the report at the moment because it, it's early. You know, we're just sort of mobilising that that response and that data request from Peel and gathering the information in to start looking at options for the for the area, the MTA, the business community. Um, but, you know, political pressure, business pressure. Um, you know, I'm making the case really, I think, you know, it, it, uh, some of the things at the moment. Councillor Hurst. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it was probably a very similar question to Councillor Kidd. Um, my understanding is that one of the issues for the, for the site has been that there isn't and there hasn't been um, a railway Despite the existence of a line pass, there hasn't been a, a railway station there, which has, has led to a lack of connectivity. Um, has there been any discussions around what pressure can be brought to to develop that, and um, and you know what it would take to improve the connectivity to be able to perhaps improve the ongoing um, profitability and, and use of the site. I, again, I'm not sure of the specifics. I know there were discussions some time ago around two options, I think, for, for rail link to the site, which obviously haven't progressed at the moment. And again, a lot would be longer term investments in any event. As I said, I think we invested somewhere around 20 million in the road connectivity to the site. I know rail's been looked at. Yeah, I don't know how critical the site is. Um, but, so I can't, I can't answer the specific question. But I know, it, I know rail links have been looked at in the past. One was extremely expensive, it was involved you know, the East Coast Main Line, um, and then another was a link directly to the airport off, off, the, off the existing railway. So I don't know how critical in, in business terms it is, definitely. I suppose uh, the question is, is you know, the long term future of the airport before we start investing in uh, like that. Do we know how much Peel bought the airport for? Originally, who from? It's an RAF, an ex RAF site, and uh, it was dated quite back. I don't know how how much it went to the market for, but it was certainly a very old RAF familiar mm. site. Well, I know it's, yeah. it's, it's actually got you know one of the longest runways in 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 the area because it was the old the Bournemouth site and things. Um, just wondering whether you know with all the investment that's gone in and, and whether Peel got a very good deal at the beginning, but uh, we need to question their motivation at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was MP for Barnsley East and Mexborough at the time, which was Doncaster, of course, um, when the RAF finally became available. And obviously at the time we had a, an elected mayor of Doncaster in charge of the authority in Doncaster, and it well, I know it was a very favourable deal that was negotiated. I can't remember the specifics of the uh, amount that it cost Peel, but Peel got an exceptionally good deal to take over the running of the airport with the support of Doncaster Council. And in fact, I I was on the inaugural flight with the Doncaster MPs when Peel actually took over the airport. And we, we were the first experimental flight out of the airport when it first opened, Chair. But they did get a very favourable deal. Thank, thank you for that confirmation. That was my recollection at, at the time as, as well. Anything else on 
the airport or indeed any other matters that we want to raise with officers or to pass on to the mayor. Um, when we look at the future agenda items, obviously I think we need to think about one we can't have Mayor Coppard in front of us. Okay, if not, let's move on to item 12 on the agenda, the launch of the Data Intelligence Hub. And this is, this is your set piece, Felix. I'm just thinking while John's trying to get the, the screen working, I'll just give some history to, to this. I mean, clearly one of the things we uh, wanted to do when we did the economic plan was to really drive um, people's understanding about the economy and therefore how we made limited resources really target the biggest areas of need and, uh, and really wanted to make quite a lot of uh, data that we had, open data, but also keep that up to date in real time. So. This has been a while in the, the planning to um, get this tool and get this uh, information together so that um, we have got everything we need to know in terms of really good quality intelligence so we can put ourselves on a strong footing uh, should government release funding. We've put ourselves on a strong footing in terms of evidence to shape what we do, that we really are doing the things that are likely to give us the sort of scale of impact you know hit it, interventions that really hit the uh, most needed areas and that so so it's a sort of information repository to support that so yep thanks Ruth so um, the <coughs> uh, the data and intelligence hub as as Ruth um, introduced is, is really about evidence uh, based decision making um, the aim when we were coming up with it was to enable better access to data and we started to map the, the type of people that, that, that used it and came up with a, a very long list including uh, the in, uh, informed residents, technical users, academics, researchers, um, uh, e even sort of passive uh, citizens as, as well. Um, and so really the, the aim of it um, was, to, was to provide a single sort of source of the truth, uh, a place to, to come for, for data, um, to enable better access to that data, to, to provide insight and allow people to, to track priorities around that, um, for us to monitor and, and highlight progress being made or, or a lack of it across the economy, um, environment or society. Um, to, to inform stakeholders um, uh, around um, uh, uh, different areas of uh, of life, society, and, and the environment, and and I suppose sort of as we were going through this development, uh, there, there's been a lot of um, bidding uh, being going on in in local government, and and this is also to inform and, and to shape better um, uh, bidding decision uh, decision making and, and business cases as well. Um, in terms of uh, what, what, we're, what we're doing, so the first part of this is uh, what we're calling the Data and Intelligence Hub is a series of dashboards. And those series of dashboards uh, highlight 130 data sets across um, 14 domains um, uh, with uh, an ambition to go forward and do further work. Around. So not just for there to be dashboards, but for there also to be maps for us to understand and unpick local level data or, or hyper-local uh, hyper data. Uh, those dashboard themes, um, uh, where we just sort of flip the screens, you, um, you could sort of uh, come across them, but um, there's health and well-being, innovation, business and enterprise, education, skills and employment, transport and mobility, um, clean energy, net zero and, and environment, land, housing, digital infrastructure, um, inclusion, uh, culture and visitor economy. Those 130 data sets were chosen um, if they met four, four criteria. So there could have been a lot more, um, but they had to meet four, four criteria. 
those criteria are the data has to be publicly available, so that the data has to be accessible to, uh, to us in the first place, um, that the data is likely to be or can be updated in, in future, um, the, uh, a very important one, and you'd be surprised at how many fail this test, um, is available at local, local authority level or below. Um, and the last test is: Is the data interesting? <laughs> does it does it show any progress? Does it does it tell us tell us something about South Yorkshire or, or individual areas? We looked at um, many areas across the country and, and what they were doing, and um, we thought um, there's a there's a really in, uh, many interesting models, and particularly the London Data Store is a very good um, example. So what they've done is uh, dump a lot of data on there, and then they've started to work through that and and, and finesse that, and that's essentially where the the journey that that we're going on. Um, a really interesting um, comparison of what we've done to what existed before. Um, on screen, this is um, the current um, uh, PT PTE part of the website, which highlights uh, transport facts and figures. It's interesting. It shows a level of uh, uh, data around uh, patronage, punctuality, and reliability. Um, where we're going with the Data and Intelligence Hub is a series of um, uh, interactive dashboard so people can uh, start to unpick that data, can download that data, use it in, uh, in whatever uh, form that they would like to, uh, take it away and do things with that, um, and click through and, and interact with it in, in a different way, as well as see some of the trends over, over, over time. Um, in terms of uh, trying to sort of show, um, show this, it's uh, something that we've, uh, we've wrestled with uh, at uh, LEP and, and MCA. Um, and so what we have is a little bit of a video, and um, I, hope, um, you, I hope it's okay to, to show this chair. Um, it's a very short video, and it will hopefully sort of walk you through um, how to use it, rather than perhaps me sort of um, clicking through a, a series of, of pages. Is that okay? The only other uh, things to say is this is an evolving picture. So uh, what we've presented so far is a first step towards um, better access, more open data. So I alluded to mapping. Um, we've had conversations with um, the chambers of commerce um, and colleges about uh, providing better labor market information, so understanding trends in the job market, uh, understanding where future jobs are available, and what that may look like, because perhaps some of the dashboards that we've presented aren't, aren't perhaps as, as user-friendly for, um, for young people, for example, so we may need to manipulate that, and uh, Xenia has been uh, instrumental um, in that. Um, I also mentioned mapping, uh, which is a very important um, aspect, and we could put lots of layers on one map, um, but I think we need to chunk that up, and that's part of the conversations that um, we're taking forward with partners.
Thank you. It was interesting that the example you chose there was on health data and not be going back to the first part of the meeting where we can pick out you know where the inequalities are and this is available to members public organizations as, as well councillor Otten, you had a question uh, yeah thank you for that I, i'm i'm obviously i i'm i'm very supportive of the of the of, of doing this sort of thing um i suppose our first question i would say is is there an api for all this because i think very often public data as a as a as a principle as a concept is most effective when uh, another organisation like like that, like my society, the the obvious one, um, is able to kind of link in and make their own products around it and add, add value to it that way. Um, members of them going straight to it as often is more difficult. And um, I, I I feel really bad trying to pick holes in it, but actually looking, I've got the I've got the culture pages open in front of me on on the laptop. I don't understand what the numbers are saying in a lot of cases. I think that the, the conceptually thing about data is what the what the numbers are showing is often quite a complex mm -hmm. concept and so it's actually very hard very often to say look we've got a really complex concept we've got some numbers that represent that let's put it in a simple package it's easy to see and easy to understand because it's it's not easy to understand so for example holiday holiday nights percentage against overall tourism nights three year average and it's got percentages for each each of the areas in in South Yorkshire. If we look over the little eye for more information, it says this: the data visual displays the percentage of holiday nights against all overism, overnight tourism nights by area. Um, I still don't understand what that means. Are you saying what percentage of tourists are on holiday, and what percentage aren't on holiday? Or, or you know, I that I'm, I don't understand what that is. It clearly is, does mean something, but it's not clear from this. The same goes for trips, so that actually the little description is the same as it was for holiday nights, but again, for trips. And, you know, I could carry on. Business in the private sector does say what it is. If I look over the fly, it says what percentage of the businesses in each region are in the culture sector. Okay, that's, a, that's well, I think that's interesting, but I don't really know what's in the culture sector and what isn't, because, you know, what are, I mean, I guess theatres are in the culture sector, but are... I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what is and what isn't. Are are pubs in the culture sector? Probably not. Are pubs that put on live music in the culture sector? You know, I, I, I it's a little bit is a little bit far removed from the information that I might, as somebody maybe interested in seeing what the culture offer is. Um, I don't think I could use this. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I think it's a great concept and a great challenge. And I think you know the work done so far is good, but. It's a it's a much bigger challenge, a much bigger problem, I think, than than uh, you know we might be seeing. So sorry if it sounded like I was having a go, but um, you know it is really difficult to do this really well. John, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So in in terms of an API, um, so um, the uh, eventual aim is that we will offer that. We also have to use APIs to feed in, and um, so we're trying to automate that at the moment, um, which is a, a really interesting process. I was on a call with um, uh, colleagues from Leicestershire, and they've tried to automate all of theirs, <coughs> and I did a similar thing of picking holes in some of their, their automation, which is why humans do need to have a role in this. Um, uh, so. Uh, that is the eventual aim uh, going forward to, to, to offer an, uh, an API to to, re to truly open this up to, to to anyone, and and I agree about telling the story. I think um, uh, we're we're taking one step towards this. I suppose what what hopefully in uh, the example that you gave there, we're we're unlocking a dialogue with yourself or users to then go into the detail. Um, um, there are there are contact details where we can sort of try and unpick that because many of the questions. Um, could lead us down, uh, I suppose, sort of quite a, a rabbit warren of, of unpicking um, office for na national uh, uh, st mm -hmm. statistics sort of um, uh, characteristics and some of the vagaries of st decisions that they've made. And sometimes it's, it's quite an easy response that we can we can we can come back on. So, um, but I agree. I think there needs to be a, a bit more of a um, a narrative ar around some of that. And that's um, I think hopefully where we will move towards. So the example I gave around um, labour market information. That's certainly a story that needs to be told. We can't just sort of give, um, just put data in front of people. But um, yeah, I, I, I take the point, and hopefully we can evolve this and, and, and add to it. Okay, thank you, Felix. Thank you, Chair. Just to add a little bit to what John is is said, if you, if I may. 
the points you made just now, Councillor, just for me is really interesting because if a member of the public goes on the Data Hub and is looking at this and has these questions, hopefully they get in touch or they send a, 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 a message to somebody, an email, we've got links there, or they follow the source and they go to find out a bit more. That alone is much further than we've ever been able to do. If we're able to get people to interact at that point, at that level, that alone is much further than we've done before. So for me, even that is a win compared to where we were before. Where we were before. But what we're looking to do is to build this in phases. So right now, the hub has official data which we really have no hand in collecting or uh, putting together in any other way apart from Xenia working her magic to put it on, on, on the system in the way it is. The next phase from here is to begin to engage with the data science community out there in the universities, businesses looking to make decisions that use there's a private sector, we know Virgin Media, Virgin has a huge data science um, operation and we are beginning to engage with them and to begin to use this and to evolve it so that we can tell more of these stories we can answer more questions that people might have or we might bring people in who can then use this to answer um, questions that might be out there because we don't have the answers to most of these questions where it's been done really well elsewhere it's gone into open data um, a lot of information is put out there. People who are interested and skilled, equipped to do this, then take the data and use it to do all sorts of wonderful things. You know, mapping people's journey, behavior, patterns, all that. And all of a sudden, we have answers to questions we never even knew we had. Hopefully, that's where we get to. Um, that's what we are working towards. But this is only step one. Um, I'm, I'm aware the, um, the Univers uh, University of Sheffield has a, a world-leading uh, information science department, so I don't know if there's a useful conversation you've had with them as to, as to where this might sort of thing might best go. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We, we know them, we work with them, we've talked with them on doing this, and we're continuing to work with them. They've got uh, the Evan Flows Observatory, for example, which they which uh, they run. One of our next phases is to begin to link the various observatories that exist in South Yorkshire, so that people only have one landing page to go to, and then they are connected to all other all, all these different sources of information. There's a bit more work to do. When we were starting down this path, the idea was to not do this, but to work with the universities to build one that covered everything. We started that. It quickly became apparent the amount of time it would take for us to get to that point, which is why we made the decision to do this to start with. And then whilst continuing that conversation, we've got a partnership with the University of Sheffield. We developed the Office for Data Analytics. We put some seed money into that. Um, so we have a channel with them, um, with Sheffield Hallam University and with other partners. So hopefully this, this is something that we'll hear more about in the time ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Yeah, um, just, just to add to that, and I think that also um, joins to uh, Council Austin's um, uh, points really, because that um, the universities are very good with data, but they're also very good at, at providing analysis and insight, and and hopefully that's that's where we can we can move into. Uh, as Felix said, I think we we could have gone down a, a different route, and it would have taken us a lot longer to um, achieve um, something. And um, we're we're of the mind that we've got something we can build upon this, and there are um, other ways of of uh, uh, building upon it, including. Uh, mapping, but further insight, analysis, um, and uh, the sharing of data being a, a further uh, step that's really important. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Is this get the access to this via the um, South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority webpage? And there's a, a direct link onto it there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay.
Okay, right, final parts of the agenda for today are um, just a reminder that the next uh, Merrill Combined Authority Board meeting is on the 19th of September at 10 a.m. and it's public, so you can tune in and, and watch that at your leisure. Um, we've got our next meeting is on the 20th of October but Christine's uh, married, who's on leave at the moment, is going to be canvassing members to, um, presumably this will be a um, remote one, um, a workshop on the work programme. I mean, we've had a couple of suggestions all already. Um, so if we can minute that uh, the retrofit, that was your, your idea, uh, Diane, and clearly, um, Merrill scrutiny needs to be fitted in, in at some point. So we'll try and get a date for a, a virtual meeting where we can uh, get ideas for, for that and, and possibly canvas availability for a single item agenda just to get the, the mayor in front of us uh, having failed this afternoon. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, it was a productive meeting, not quite as short as I predicted at the, at the start, Council Lodge, but never mind. Um, there's lots of uh, questions there, and hopefully uh, the minutes will capture that and we'll get some answers from it then. Thank you very much.